Hey, listen, so if you have a Bible, open up your Bible today. We're going to be in the book of John chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. If you ever need a Bible, we can get you a Bible. I will personally deliver you a Bible if you need one. Um, the Bible is not a book. It is a library of books that ultimately point to Jesus and what he has done for us. There are, in the New Testament, there's these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are kind of like biographies of Jesus' life when he walked this earth. And we're going to be in the book of John today. And um, if you don't have a Bible, they will, the words will be behind me on the screen. There is some value. I want to encourage you guys. There is some value to like having the Bible in front of you and looking at it. Maybe it's in a book or on, on your phone to help you engage with the text. So John chapter 11 is where we're going to be. And I don't know, so it, if you guys have ever had the feeling like you see something going on in life and you're like, God, I think you should probably do something about that. Like, like that's a really bad thing going on and I'm pretty sure that you're God and you can do anything you want and I'm pretty sure you should probably do something about that. Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah? Okay, me too. And we've been talking about this in this past series that we're concluding today about times when God just seems uncooperative or distant. Or, as we see today, he, he seems late. He seems inattentive. And, and so what we've been saying every single week is that if you ever feel like God is inattentive or uncooperative or late, you are in good company. Because people throughout the Bible felt this way and share this feeling with you. And in fact, we're going to engage with some people today who felt exactly this way. Now, part of the struggle with this message series is that we sometimes as we engage in these conversations when God feels late or, or unco uncooperative, like it's not just some emotionally satisfying thing where we're like, oh, yay, everything in life makes sense now. It's still hard but at least we can have some hope. And at least more than hope, we can experience real, deep, joy-filled life in the meantime. So, in the past couple weeks, we saw John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer was in a literal prison, but also a figurative prison of his own pain and suffering. And in the context of that, he looked outside of his situation to see how God was at work and therefore gained hope. Last week, we saw how God uses, like he, he does this crazy reversal where he almost defies the power of weakness by using weakness to make his power perfect. It says God's power is made perfect in our weakness. And we saw some amazing examples of how that worked out in real people's lives last week. This week, we're going to be hanging out with Mary and Martha today. Today is going to be a very text-heavy, like, message. We're going to be going through literally 42 verses today. So put your seatbelts on, giddy up, open your Bibles, let's go. All right, so John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mar Mary and Martha, I'm sorry, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So these were real people. Like, hey, he's saying, John, being a, a, writing a historical document, is saying this was this Mary, this particular Mary, and she was well known because she had done some things that made her very well known. That's a different sermon for a different time, but she had a bit of a reputation. Okay, so these are real people. Verse 3. The sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. They didn't say his name. They didn't say Lazarus is ill. They're just like, hey, the one you love. Which is a great way to identify yourself, by the way. Like, if you're ever not sure like, how to make heads and tails of life, just like, I'm the one Jesus loves. Now, they may have just been referencing, like, the way Jesus loved him. This could have been also, have you ever... Have you ever seen someone do a little manipulative thing where they like, they're asking for help, but they don't really ask for help? Where they're like, gosh, kind of short on gas money. Don't know where I might get some gas money. Right? Kind of, so it kind of feels like they're just going, hey, Jesus, something's going on here, right? But we're not really asking for anything overtly, but they're putting it out there. Okay, verse four. But when Jesus heard it, 
He said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Whoa. Okay, so remember those situations where we're like, yeah, God should do something about that. Well, here's a that. <laughs> and it's like God almost created the that. Like, he's like, okay, this, this is going to be for God's glory. I'm going to use this situation for the glory of God. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Why does it say this? I think John includes this little line in there because we're going to need the reminder that Jesus loves these people because apparently he's going to act in a way that might make us ask the question of whether or not he loves them. He's going to act in a way that's not how we would act if we were engaging with someone we loved. So he's like, just by the way, you're going to read some crazy stuff here. Jesus loves them, okay? It's like we said before, like when, when, a, when you're taking your kid in to go get shots at the doctor, you're like, this is going to hurt, I love you, okay? All right. Like this next verse, verse 6, listen to this. So Jesus, here's, here's how it goes down. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he rushed his, no, that's not what it says. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, okay, let us go to Judea again. Like, your friend, the one you love, like, the, the, the buddy, like, the guy, he's ill. He's really not doing well. And Jesus is like, well, there's this falafel restaurant I, that kind of closed on the weekends. I want to hit him. No, like, that, that didn't really happen. But, like, he's just like, okay, well, let's stay two days more. Totally counterintuitive to what we would expect a loving Jesus to do. What is happening here? And then he goes, okay, yeah, and then, and then, and then we'll, go, we'll go see him. Look at verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? So Jesus had, had just been, like, literally threatened, his life threatened, because people were, to, were going to stone him, throw rocks at him until he dies. They did that back then. And the disciples are like, hey, um, you sure you want to go back there, Jesus? We're surprised that Jesus lingered for two days. They're surprised that Jesus considered going back at all because they're like, we don't want you to get stoned. Like, now, they, I'm sure they were concerned for Jesus. I think they may have been just a touch concerned for themselves as well. Because if you were hanging out with your teacher, with the one, like the one that you associate with, and people are trying to kill him, guess what they're probably trying to do to you? Kill you as well. And when people are throwing rocks at your boy, some of those rocks hit you. And so notice the complexity of the human situation. We have Mary and Martha wanting Jesus to come quickly, praying to Jesus to come quickly, and then we have his disciples going, I don't think you should go at all, big boy. One person's praying for one thing, the other person's praying for the exact opposite. It's hard for us to see outside our individual situation, isn't it? Look at verses 9 and 10. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. <laughs> and they're like... Okay, we were talking about you getting stoned. What? So, again, Jesus, to see what this means, just a few chapters earlier in John 9, 4, Jesus had said, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus, in other words, is saying, hey, look, I'm only here for a short time. We've got to do this work now. I'm going to put my light in you, and it's going to sustain you, but there's some things that we need to do while I'm here, okay? So this is what we're doing. So in other words, let's go see Lazarus. We see that in verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to waken him. Okay, verse 12. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Okay, get a little more specific. Verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking his rest and sleep. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Okay? I just... So you can getting real specific here. It makes me wonder sometimes, like, when I'm reading the Bible or when Jesus is leading me to do something, if he's just got, he's just got to spell it out so clear for me. He's like, go over here. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I don't, he's like, no, let me, let me write it in crayons for you, Paul, okay? So this is what's happening here, all right? So Lazarus has died. It's done. Like, real obvious. Lazarus has died. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Okay, verse 15. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. What? Doesn't that just seem cruel? Lazarus died. Sure glad I wasn't there to heal him when he's still alive. So that you may believe, but let us go to him. Notice. We think this is about Lazarus dying. It's not. It's about their faith. Jesus is going, this isn't about Lazarus dying or not dying, sick or not sick. This is about you, your heart, your faith. So often we think our lives are about the circumstances. And Jesus has this way of like asking questions and saying things where he's going like, hey guys, this isn't, ah, this isn't about the circumstance. Can we talk about your heart for a minute? Can we talk about your faith for a minute? We're like, but the circumstances. The, he's like, okay, okay, cool. I love you. I love you. Hey, can we actually have something better for you? Okay. So when we go, like, why doesn't God do something about that? He's actually allowing a that to happen. And he's going, I'm glad that happened for the sake of your faith. Unbelievable. Verse 16, so Thomas called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, this could be like a courageous, yes, let us also go and die with him. I think Thomas is, like given his, his what's going to, he's going to act in the future, given how he's going to act in the future, I think Thomas is being a sarcastic little. <laughs> I think so. Fine, yeah, great idea, Jesus. Let's go die with them because we're just going to get, we're going to get stoned there. And not like stone, but like stone, like rocks thrown at us. Okay, like, right? I think he's being sarcastic. So verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found Lazarus already had been in the tomb four days. This is important because there was a, a bit of a superstition at that time that the spirit remained with the body after death for three days. And around that fourth day is when, gosh, it's kind of graphic, but when like the physical de decomposition process happens and the face begins to change, and they were like, oh, that's when the spirit leaves. So even the superstitious people were going like, hope is gone. He's not just dead. He's like dead, 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 okay? That's what they're saying here, okay? Verse 18 and 19. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Like, it's done. They're consoling. They're like funeral time. Like, like and I just imagine the dynamics here. Mary and Martha had sent to Jesus because at some degree they had faith. They had faith that Jesus could do something about this. There's the that. Jesus, you should do something about that. And they send for Jesus for that purpose. And I can just imagine them. That's not, but I can just imagine them going, man, you know, we're, we're, like Jesus is going to come. Like we've seen him. We've seen him. We've seen Jesus, you know, heal people. We've seen him heal even like really sinful people. We've seen him have mercy. We've even seen him heal like families of the evil Roman government. Like, trust me, Jesus can do like, you just watch. He's going to show up. And then he didn't. He may not, Jesus, we had faith in you, and you, not only did you let us down, but we also look like idiots. You're making it look like you're not who, who, we, who you say you are. Come on, Jesus. Verse 20. So when Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Why do you think Mary remained seated in the house? I don't know. I mean, does, I, yeah, maybe she's mad. That's, that's kind of what it seems like. I mean, we can only guess. But like we could imagine, like, when, when it feels like God has let you down, you ever felt like, you know what, <laughs> sorry, God, I, I, I just can't even talk to you right now. Like, some of us have felt this way. Like, I'm, I, I, I ain't even get up out of house. Mary, you, Martha, you go ahead. You go, you go talk to him. He hurt me. Oof. Verse 21. 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She just puts it right out there. I respect that. And she's actually right. Like, he could have prevented this from happening. Good, honest struggle with God. I respect that. Verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So she's, got, she's like, I'm struggling with you, but like, I, 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 know that, I know that you're God. Like, I know that you can do stuff. And she just, ah, there's still some hope. And I admire that she's actually still got some faith at this point. Verse 23 and 24. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So it's like, <laughs> Martha thinks he's like pulling out one of those niceties, like at funerals, oh, he's in a better place. And like, n the interesting thing is we, we assume that what she wants Jesus to do is raise him from the dead. But apparently that's not even a consideration in her mind. Because when he says, your brother's going to rise, she doesn't think like, oh, awesome, thank you, that's exactly what I wanted. No, she, like, it, it, it feels to me like that's not even on her radar. It's a possibility. Because when he brings it up, she, she's like, oh, yeah, at the last day when you make everything, okay, cool, that's cool. That's, thank you, I guess, yeah, he's in a better place, whatever. But then look what happens. So she's not expecting him to raise from the dead. Verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Guys, listen to me. Good religious teachers don't say this. Moral philosophers that teach you about how to live life don't say this. This is a literal claim to be God. Jesus is, like, I am the resurrection and the life. You don't say that if you're not claiming to be the resurrection and life. This is a claim to be God, the way to life, the creator, the author, the sustainer, the sustainer, the renewer, the giver of life. Whoever believes in me, he says, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So the Greek grammar here is super strong. He goes, if someone believes in me, they, it's, the, it's like a double emphatic, certainly sure as all get out, won't die. <laughs> If you believe in me, you don't die. We know that Jesus, how does he, how does he reckon death? It's just sleep. A little night-night. A little nappy-nap. This, this is what you, I've conquered death. This is an immense claim here going on. This is what Jesus says. Death might get a brief moment of glory Seems like death is going to have its way, but it, I will not let death have the final word. I will not. Did you hear that question at the end of verse 26? Do you believe this? Like with, hey, hey, Martha, with all that you're feeling right now, feeling like I've let you down, feeling like I've disappointed you, that I've made myself and you look like a fool, Right in the middle of this, before anything has changed in your circumstances, do you believe this? That's hard. Verse 27 and 28. Listen to this. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. And when she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So he's like, do you believe this? And she's like, yeah, I, I believe that you're the promised one. It's like... I feel like she's going like, I don't, I don't quite follow everything there, Jesus, but I got some faith. It reminds me of a guy in the book of Mark. He, he had asked Jesus, he was like, if you can, can you please help my child who is sick? This is in Mark chapter 9, um, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the cr child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> you ever feel like that? You're like, I'm not... I'm not completely void of faith, but uh, I've got some voids in my faith. So, so I think that I, this is very similar to what Martha's going through here. She's like, ah, yeah, I don't fully follow you, though, Jesus, but I, I, I believe you are who, who you say you are. And so, okay, verse 29. When she heard of it, Mary, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha 
had met him. When the Jews who were with her in her house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing Martha felt. Doesn't it just, isn't there at least some comfort to knowing that the, the, the people who literally followed Jesus physically and knew him and saw the miracles, even they struggled like we struggle, going, God, if you had been there, man, I feel like you let me down, God. Like, isn't it just a comfort knowing Mary and Martha felt that too? And they are pillars of the faith. Pillars of the faith these women are. So, verse 33 when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Jesus, the creator of the universe, was deeply troubled, like moved in spirit. He was disquieted, like unsettled. The, the word there means great mental distress. The God of the universe had great mental distress when he saw them weeping. Verse 35, Jesus wept. It's the whole verse, shortest verse in the Bible. I think there's a great comfort there too. The, the times in our lives where circumstances are such that we're going, it's not supposed to be this way, God. It's not supposed to be this way. Jesus weeping to me says, I agree. Jesus is going, you're right, it's nuts. Like Jesus weeps in the face of death. He, when we, he sees death, he just, oh. When he sees where they laid him, he can fix the whole thing. And so, so when you are in a situation where you're going, God, it's not supposed to be this way, there's a high likelihood that Jesus is right behind you going, I agree, man, I agree. And I'm weeping with you. What a comfort, man. Not a distant watchmaker God who created the watch, wound it up, and walked away. But God who's with you, whose heart is broken alongside yours. Look at verses 36 and 37. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could he, not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Hey, which one are you? Like... They observed the exact same thing. And one said, oh, man, look at the love. And the other was like, jerk. Heaping accusation on him. Where, 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 do you, where do you tend in life? When you see the complex interactions of God with our world, do you just go, Psh, idiot. I don't even understand. Couldn't you? Or are you able to see through? Wait, wait, wait. wait. There's lo I see, look how he loves Verse 38, 39. Then Jesus, deeply moved, there's that word again, he's distressed. Again, came to the tomb, it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, like, we already know she's the sister of the dead man. Like, why do he say that? It's like he's emphasizing, Martha, you know the one who was the sister of the guy who's legit four days dead? said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. I think this is comic relief. Like, if you've ever been to a funeral where we're all weeping and we're all crying, and then someone, like, says something and everyone starts cracking up, right? So, like, I, I think, I think Jesus is like, yeah, roll the st stone away. Like, he's weeping, everyone's crying. And then, Mary, you know, Martha's like, yeah, roll the stone. What? what, Jesus? Like, he's gonna stink. It's four days, Jesus. Unbelievable. And then we look at verse 40. Look what happens. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So if you continue to put, Martha, I told you, like, if you, if you put one step in front of the other, one foot, just keep, you're going to see the glory of God in this, even in this pain. So 
They took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe you sent me. So like in a, in a movie, this would be so cool. Just the, the drama, the tension. He's like, hey, move the stone. Now, you don't move a stone just by going bloop. Like it's a big stone. It's like men got to get on that and leverage it. Probably like, you know, my pry bar or something. I don't know. They're moving this stone out of the way. And Jesus is like, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Right? Hey, God, thank you for what we're about to see. I'm saying this for everybody in the room. This is the equivalent of in basketball sitting at the three-point shot, throwing up a shot and turning around and walking away. Because you know that bad boy is going to drop. He's like, I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. Behold the glory of God, right? So verses 43 and 44, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. I love it again. Not, not Lazarus came out. The man, uh, just in case you forgot, who had died came out. His hands and feet bound up with linen strips. His face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So at this time, the way they prepared people for, for burial, like, like they were wrapped up in cloths and stuff. So he yells at Lazarus to come out. Homeboy comes out like all covered up like a mummy. <laughs> and it was just like, and Jesus is like, y'all may want to help him with the strips of cloth. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Right? <laughs> right? It's just, I just, I think, you know, I don't know. I just I, the way that John writes this, I absolutely love. He had to tell him to move. Verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did and believed in him. Yeah, I guess so. You see something like that, you're like, yep, what that guy says is true. There was no disputing that this man was dead. This wasn't figurative. This wasn't like soul like sleep. It wasn't like he fainted and was, you know, oh, for three. No, like he was dead. Okay. But listen to this. Verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So then they have all these conversations. And then look, skip ahead to verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. Now, isn't that something? They didn't dispute what he had done. But they refused to see him in it. They refused the gift that he had for them in it. They refused to see that Jesus loved them too. Remember when John gave us a little reminder, like, oh, by the way, Jesus loved them. <laughs> now, they, didn't, they didn't get that part. Like, I think we can all agree that we are finite human beings. Like, we don't, there's so much in this world that we don't see and understand. Like, I think we can all agree on that. And maybe you might even agree with me that, like, for me, so much of this, I would say the most consistent di distress that anyone causes in my life is myself. And it's the distress that comes from my own thinking, my own false narratives, the way I perceive things, the way I respond. Like, that's where m probably most of my distress comes from. Like, there are legitimately bad situations that cause me distress, but the way that I deal with them often gives me more distress, than this, right? And so am I willing to at least consider <laughs> that maybe I might trust God's ways instead of mine, given the fact that I get so much wrong all of the time? Like, am I willing to consider that? Let me ask you this. So I think we covet a big miracle like this. Like, we want a big miracle like this. Would we still covet it? Like, imagine if Lazarus would have been raised and then died again like five minutes later. Would we still think it's cool? Okay, okay. What about if he was raised but then he died like half an hour later? Is that still cool? Okay, okay. What about if he was raised but then he died like a day later or a week later or two weeks later or a month later or a year later? Like, here's what I'm trying to tell you guys. Lazarus died again. He died, like his family would have to mourn his death again. 
the miracle was not about the miracle. <laughs> the miracle was about a greater hope that Jesus was bringing a full and eternal life. And, and, and life that, that is eternal, but that begins even now. In fact, the miracle of raising Lazarus was too small. If someone would have asked for that miracle, they would have been asking for, for it would be too small of an ask. Because it wouldn't solve the ultimate problem. It would have been too small of an ask because it would have fixed only the situation that was in front of them. But God can see more than what's just in front of us. Sometimes the miracle we want is too small of an ask. Because we're asking for something that will only fix what's right in front of us. And God says, I have a greater hope for you. A more lasting hope for you. Apparently, we need something more sometimes than the miracle we're asking for. So, I've said it before, I'll say it again. This is how I think we can look at it. We live in a broken world. And the only way for God to take all of the brokenness out of the world would be to take us out of the world because we're a cause of some of the brokenness. So, besides that, I guess he could also just make us unthinking robots where we can't make choices and can't choose bad things. But then we still have that whole issue of death. The only other thing he could do is just come and make it all new. And he goes, ah, that's what I'll do. Jesus, God himself, comes to this earth and took away all of the things in our lives that, that bring brokenness and all of the things in the world that bring brokenness, he took on himself so that he could make all things new one day, new heavens, new earth, and he came to this earth, gave his life so that he could ensure that you could be there and I could be there with him. And in the meantime, he says, I want you to know that when you are struggling and you're going, gosh, it's not supposed to be that way, I agree with you. It's not supposed to be this way. And that's why I've come to make all things new. And in the meantime, I'm going to show you glory that will actually give you hope, give you meaning of life, give you fullness of life now and even through eternity. Because he had told them, this is, I want you to see my glory because there's actually healing that happens in that process. And as we learned last week, he does this great reversal where he takes the weakness of life, puts it on its head, does a huge reversal and defies weakness by working power in weakness so that we can see his glory and experience a taste of life on this side of heaven. This is what he does for us. So, when you are going through a time where it seems like God is late, he's not showing up. Well, Jesus, if you would have showed up then, when you're going through a time like that, just do at least two things. One, identify your frustration and be honest with God about it. Might help to be honest with some people about it too. Yeah, it would. Be honest with God. Mary and Martha were. God, <laughs> you didn't show up on time. Be honest with him. And then pray a prayer something like this. God, help me to see your glory and believe that you can bring some life into my situation. Help me to see, like, like, like Martha was going, I believe, but I just... I don't fully see it. We go, God, help me to see your glory. I'm going to see your work in glory, even through this weakness, so that, so that I can believe and trust that you've got some life for me in this situation. And it will be greater than we imagined. Jesus brought about something that Martha hadn't even imagined could happen. And he can do the same for us.